Okay, seems like everybody settled in. So welcome and uh, thank you for joining us. And I wanted to take a few minutes to uh, introduce uh, Jardin and his uh, father, Paolo, and uh, tell you a little bit why I'm very excited about this uh, topic. Now, if you are a scientist and you work in areas like um, neurobiology, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and sooner or later, probably like any human or any scientist, you get intrigued with the phenomenon of, of consciousness. And then you make the, the galling realization that the methods of experimental science are not all that well suited to study the phenomenon of consciousness. So let me explain this a little bit. So as scientists, or when science is at its best, then what you do is you don't take some old book and you believe everything that's written in there. You're invited to use your own brain, to form your own ideas. Of course, you're most welcome to adopt some of the notions that some of the grandmasters that came before you have developed. But ultimately, it's incumbent on you to take your ideas and then very carefully take a look at nature. Let's say you stare at the night sky, you see an apple falling down from a tree, or you look how a plant or a, a baby grows. And then you see whether your ideas, how you think the world is ticking, really apply. So while this program has yielded enormous technological successes, um, but of course if you're really honest, then we realize that our ideas, how the world is really working, are fairly feeble. And in particular, what's galling is sort of that this primordial experience, your conscious experience, and as Descartes taught us, that's really the only thing we can be, be certain of as an experience. Everything else could be some form of illusion. That this primary experience is so poorly accessible by the methods, by this program of experimental science. For example, if you ask sort of a, what I think is a very reasonable question, is consciousness only existing in the brains of higher mammals, or is it also outside of it? For example, what about a modern flight control system? Uh, if it, as it steers the airplane, is it aware of the state the airplane is in? Could ask that question. Or a, a tree, is a tree, is there some faculty within a tree that's kind of aware of, let's say, the moisture content in the ground, or whether it's being attacked by beetles or not? So. I think it will not do you much good then if you were to calculate something what's, for example, called the Tononi Phi measure. That was a pretty popular measure a few years ago to assess or describe the amount of consciousness in a system. But um, others may agree, but I feel this is a somewhat futile exercise because if you compute the Tononi Phi measure for the flight controller, I cannot see often or imagine an independent experiment where you could assess the content and intensity of the conscious first-person perspective this flight controller has. And that's very different to external observables like speed. Now, if I make a prediction on the speed of an airplane, I have a well-defined measurement prescription to see what the speed is. But the intensity, content of consciousness, it's not accessible in that way. And that's where, I think, shamanism and the, the Yawanawa come in, and they are wisdom that I would sort of consider a world cultural heritage. Because something you can do is you can take your own apparatus, or appareio, I see, Portuguese, um, in Portuguese you would call it. You know your own apparatus houses direct conscious experience you're aware of. And what you could do is you could change the configuration of your appareil and bring it into an altered state as of the conscious experience may be very different. And the Awanawa have developed, and other tribes in the region, have developed a lot of techniques how to achieve this well, how you can go from your default consciousness to an altered state and get back in a reasonably safe passage and live to tell the tale. 
even though I should maybe on TV shows I always have the sticker, don't try this at home alone. <laughs> so I think <laughs> some of the things you're going to see today, I think a similar caveat applies. But um, last comment added, if you go through these experiences, they don't only afford you with sort of a richer portfolio of what conscious states or conscious experience could be like. Most people also make the striking experience that once they got back, they also in a physiological way feel much better and healthier than before for weeks to come. And I'm pretty certain that sort of FDA type studies will confirm what right now I think is just a, a safe hunch to have. And here I want to allow myself to note I once spoke with uh, the Undersecretary of Biodiversity. It's actually a student of uh, Richard Evans Schultes, who is sort of the, the doyen, the, the, the great um, American ethnobotanist um, from the, he was the director of the Harvard um, Botanical Institute. And this, uh, his student told me that the region we are talking about, so the um, Gregorio River in the state of Acre, was the Avanava settle, that probably 95% of the plants and plant medicines the Avanava are using are not described anywhere. They're in the notebooks and not characterized. So it's this really rare and fragile knowledge. And I think the very implication that sort of, that these, many of these uh, substances carry the term medicine. And again, first an experience tells you why this is. But I feel in our culture, we still have to come to grips with the implications of the fact that these medicines, they don't only work on a physiological level, but it goes hand in hand. And maybe they only work because there's also a sort of cathartic mental psychological element to the use of the functioning of these substances. So with this, I want to hand it to Jordan Melo Sosa I see full name and he's a young man uh, growing up in, in Rio de Janeiro and he is, like many of us here, he is uh, studying uh, engineering and he is particularly interested in, in forest management and sustainability in civil engineering and construction and also social inclusion aspects. He's also the board member of an NGO called Indigenous Celebration that sets up projects to help protect the Yavanava culture and the rainforests. It, depends on. And uh, Jordan had sort of an interesting upbringing in the sense that he is the grandson of um, a revered religious leader in Brazil, um, uh, Padrinho Sebastião Mota Emelo. He is a leader in the Santo Daime tradition. And also his father, he continued this lineage here to, among many things to his credit, uh, one important achievement was that he organized and led the scientific commission that convinced the Brazilian government to legalize ayahuasca for religious and ceremonial purposes in Brazil, a little bit similar like the Native American church here in North America, and in the US, I should say, is permitted to use peyote in their ceremonies. So with this, I'm very curious to hear from the two of you about sort of the experiences during the Dieta, and Jordan will give the talk, but Paolo more often referred to as the ambassador to the Amazonian people because I feel many of these contacts we, we owe to Paolo, and I think only because of sort of this family heritage, actually, Jordan was admitted to the tribes and was led into some of their uh, most intimate knowledge. So yeah, you will be the VJ, I think, controlling the presentations, and Jordan will be the DJ controlling the sound. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Hartmut, for your kind presentation, your kind introduction. Yeah. Uh, I would like to say that I'm really happy to be here uh, to speak at Google. Uh, for me, this looks like a temple of advanced knowledge of high tech and innovation. So I feel really honored to be speaking here about the mysteries of Amazon. Yeah. So my first contact uh, with the Amazon Indians were by the Yawanawa people. Uh, it was when Pajé Yawa, yeah. Pajé for people that uh, doesn't know is 
Kama the translation for shaman. Yeah. So Pajé Yawa visited our community in Rio de Janeiro with his group. And uh, Pajé Yawa is one of the greatest people that I ever had the chance to meet. Yeah. At the time, I was 15 years old, and Pajé Yawa was 97 years old. And uh, when I started talking to him, I would start noticing uh, the amount of energy, the amount of joy, and the amount of knowledge that he has and is capable of transmitting this in such a natural way. Uh, so we invited him, uh, him and their, his group to present their traditions for us. So we did a ceremony uh, where we would take Uni, uh, also known as Ayahuasca. Uh, and uh, during this ceremony, uh, uh, with the intake of this medicine, you enter in a state of uh, visionary experience. Uh, and in his visions, he saw in the mountain in front of our house uh, an ancestor spirit of an uh, old uh, Indian. And connected with the spirit, and called the spirit to do a special healing work for my father that at the time was suffering some serious back problems. So we did this another ceremony, a more close, with just my family and their groups. And after the, this work he did on my father, all his back problems uh, were gone. And this got me really impressed. Uh, and I had start having more interest about uh, Pajé Yawa, about th their culture, about their people. Yeah. In the same ceremony, uh, an alliance was formed between our spiritual community and their people. Uh, and this, so they invited us to meet their place, to meet their forest, their people. And it was when. Uh, at uh, a few months after, once I traveled together with my father to experience their festival. Yeah. It's a festival that is done once a year to celebrate the old, old traditions and ancestors. Yeah. This festival, during the days, yeah, so before explain a little bit where it is this tribe. Yeah, uh, it's located in Acre, yeah, a Brazilian state uh, inside the Amazon forest. Uh, it took us three days from Rio de Janeiro to the village, uh, including two flights, a truck drive, and a boat trip, seven, seven hours of a boat trip upriver, getting deeper and deeper into the Amazon forest. Once we arrived there uh, for the festival, uh, during the days, uh, the festival uh, has a lot of games. Uh, their traditional games and dancing and chanting. So it was for me a big experience to get to know the young generation, how they how they interact. Uh, they most of them completely speak Portuguese. So I was able to fully connect and interact with them. Uh, and at the nights, uh, the nights are reserved for their ceremonies, their spiritual ceremonies, whereas there's intake of only uh, until that moment, from from I have already heard a lot yeah, about visionary experience. I have read, read something, but I could never really trust or believe those experiences just by hearing something similar what Hartmut was telling. Yeah. It, when it comes to something like this, uh, you need to experience by yourself. So. It was then, in uh, 2009, when I was 15 years old, that I had my first visionary experience with the medicines. Uh, the way the ceremony works, they have a, a big circle where they dance. There is a big fire and uh, a spot for them to, to be seated. Uh, I took the, the uni and started dancing with them. I was with a, a straw skirt, all painted and with a Marco uh, feather dress. Uh, so at the time that I was dancing, I would start feeling kind of dizzy and 
and getting caught by the force of the medicine. So I decided to uh, go take a seat. As I was going to take a seat, my feather dress were a bit loose, so it fell in front of me. As it fell, I closed my eyes. Once I closed my eyes, the feather dress in the visionary straight state transformed into a macaw, the spirit of a macaw. And this spirit started flying, hovering around me yeah, in circles. And in those circles, we started establishing a connection where I was uh, in her and she was in me. And once this connection was established, I could see through its eyes. Yeah. And suddenly, the macaw got its claw and ripped the air. Yeah. So we ripped the air and opened up a tunnel of light, of energy, of colors. And we entered together on that. And together in this trip, uh, the, the, the spirit of the animal will start sharing many things with me. But out of that, I, was, I, I had an a, a aerial view of the village, something that I have never seen on pictures or movies before. Yeah. So we were start getting closer and closer uh, to a guy that was facing the other way. And at the moment, I realized that guy was me. I woke up from that experience, completely impressed and, and, and not knowing well what was going. Yeah. So during this festival this week, I could really interact with the people there, with nature and with cosmos. Yeah. So once I got back to, to the city and I started seeing the, the difference that the seven days have uh, done for me. Yeah. In those seven days, I experienced a new way of existing, yeah. a new way of interaction with amongst my, even the relationship with myself, with the others, yeah, with nature, and with the creator. So once, once I would start processing that, I realized how that tribe, how that place is a source yeah, of experience and knowledge yeah, that uh, can take you to some new some new uh, comprehension about yourself, yeah, about the, your environment, about the world, how it, how, how it functions. Yeah. I will start sharing this with some friends yeah, from Brazil, Canada, US, and um, I start noticing the same thirst, the same, how do you say, excitement about when I was sharing. They, they look really, they needed that too. Yeah. So, and of course, I needed that again. <laughs> so, but I, I, that, in, on my second trip, I decided to do something different. Yeah. The festival is when they all get reunited and they, they present yeah, what is their, their tradition, games, and all this. But I was more interested how they live. Yeah. What's their day by day there, their daily life? And it was then when I formed a group with, 12 young people, and we went again to the Amazon forest. Uh, during that time, yeah, we were able to, without Wi-Fi, apps, uh, internet, all this, we were able to fully detach from civilization. Yeah. So, and this opened up, created a whole new space for situations and interactions with the people there with nature and their spirituality. And so they will take us to do some, some daily life activity, such as go for to get some food or, or how to rest or, or take a walk. Yeah. And in those experiences, such as uh, go fishing, for example, yeah. uh, Tawahu, uh, my Indian friend, he invited me to go fishing with him. So I, w I waited the whole day, and he he did up, uh, was okay. And then at night he came and said, "What about the fishing?" It's like I was waiting for you. You you didn't come up. He said, "No, we're going now." And he handed me a machete and a flashlight. This was already 9 p.m. So I was like, "Are we going to cut our fish?" No, we we're going to to fish with that. Yeah. So we went uh, in the night to the, the river there. 
in that season, the river stays really low up to our calves. Yeah? And we were uh, going up river, walking with the flashlight, and he said, with the machete, you just give a little knot in, in the, the fish head and throw him on the bucket. I'm not sure if it was my shaky legs or my really heavy steps, but I were able to find no fish. And uh, at the moment I found my first fish, I got so excited that I struck him so hard, he was split in two. I went for the head and the whole body went away. Yeah. So this, this, little, this experience that for them are completely uh, normal and regular, uh, for us, it's something that uh, is, is completely extraordinary, you know, for you to, to go there and have this experience. And uh, so this close interaction with nature and the development of those new skills grant me the, how, the what we call a uh, spiritual awakening. Yeah. A whole part of myself yeah, that uh, during, my during my whole life in the city was asleep. And uh, it, this part of myself woke up in the middle of the forest. For my friends, uh, each one, each and single one of them, uh, those experiences ignited a whole process of self-transformation and healing. Yeah. And for me, as I was already more used to it, it but uh, ignited me, uh, I'll call a uh, initiation yeah, into my spiritual development, yeah, into the medicines, and into their dietas, their diets. So it was then that uh, in the second trip, uh, I would start paying more attention yeah, uh, to the elders. Uh, the elders there, they have a much deeper connection with nature and its vast quantity of medicines. They can be divided in two basic groups. Yeah? The pages, the shamans, that heal through their spirituality and their mental medicines. And the Nipoihu, yeah? it's why they call the medicine men, that they heal uh, with the plants and, and the animals and what is in their surrounding. Though I had a chance to walk with some of those guys, and the impression that I got is that they see the forest as a, as a huge drugstore. Yeah? Uh, we were walking for 10 minutes, and he would pick up a leaf, and say this is for something. He will pick up a root and say you mix that with this and that's for for that. Yeah. And uh, so, in as I was speaking, uh, we were able to experience that. Yeah. Uh, our group that was not used at all to Amazon weather and climb. We we arrived there with diarrhea, with fever, with headaches, and as soon as we shared that with them. They, they started walking in different directions and brought something for us to uh, leave, for us to rub and smell. And that really strong smell will go into our minds and the headache will be gone instantly. They brought some roots that will chew on it and swallow the juice that will help with diarrhea. So long story short, uh, in the next day, everybody was 100%. Yeah? All the, the little diseases that happened through the process were gone. So this is something that really gives credit to what those people are saying. Because they could get an a ordinary leaf and say, this is for that, this is for that, and we we'll never know. Yeah. So through our experience, yeah, we were uh, seeing how, how value it is, how, how much worth it has, this, this culture. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> For for at, at the end of the of the trip, yeah, together with the Indians, because this for us was extremely new, yeah, uh, and something we have we, we didn't thought about it, it what it was for them. Yeah. The with, with the contact with white people, yeah, it created a big gap between the generations of the elder and the young people. Yeah. The young people they speak mostly Portuguese. They, they, they were more interested in, in, in other, uh, how to say, other type of music than they, their ancestor music. 
so so when they saw our group coming with many skills and uh, we will start playing music together to teaching them how to play guitar and all this and when they saw all those guys uh, we we had a snowboarder uh, that showed a little bit about uh, wh how it is to, to go into the slopes and the snow so they start seeing well, wow, those guys come from different part of the world, and they come here to appreciate what we have. So what we have has value. So what we have has 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 a potential. Yeah. So together with this, uh, with ours knowing, we start strengthening the young generation to keep uh, preserving their culture, to keep living as the elders do. Uh, wanna so. In these ceremonies and together with the relationship with the elders, we are able to fully discover yeah, the extensive amount of medicines that they have. Yeah. The most extensive group are the plants medicine. Yeah. So they have plants for every, almost every single situation you may have, you may happen to you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, different allergies, nausea, uh, they, all that they have something. Yeah? They have a data which they're really proud of that uh, in in their their people they have never heard about somebody that died from a snake bite, and this is because they have uh, plants for each type of species. Yeah? Each type of uh, of snakes has its own plants. Together with this, their medicines are not used only to to treat, uh, but also to facilitate, to help their way there. They they have a, a full section of medicines for women that are pregnant. Uh, so so when when the time is, is coming, they, they take uh, uh, some leaves to help the, the dilatation process. They have leaves for to, to go fast. And uh, once the baby is born, his first touch with the medicines is when uh, he starts crying at night and all this. So they give a special bath on the children with some special leaves that uh, gets the baby really relaxed. And uh, you know what? Uh, you know what? We we I had a, a the pleasure to meet a young boy. Yeah, he's probably four, I would say. And uh, he was at town and got bit by a really poisonous snake. Uh, his mother, her, his mother took her, him to to the hospital, uh, and they said the only way out of this would be to cut his leg. Uh, of course, she was devastated with that. Uh, so she called the Nipoihu, the medicine man, and delivered the children to him. And so they did the treatment. Uh, Everything worked out, and a couple months ago, I just played soccer with him. So he is uh, really, really healthy and, and, and doing great. Besides the besides the the plants medicines, there are also the animal medicines, and probably one of the most important of those medicines is the kombu. The kombu is this frog. Yeah, the, this, the, the way the medicine works, you get the resin of the frog yeah, and you burn little dots with a stick just to take the superficial layer of your skin and after you put the resin on you. This little drink that is on the on screen is a uh, manioc juice, something that you drink a lot. So when, when combo starts to have its effect, yeah, that is, you start to feel your, your throat getting dry, you start to feel your body temperature raising, it starts to get kind of dizzy, and that's when the cleansing happens, yeah, when you start purging. And uh, there's already many studies about uh, this combo. Yeah. There's uh, some Italian and Japanese companies trying to do some, some Western drugs to, to regulate the pre uh, the heart pressure, yeah. but this medicine is not just a physical uh, experience. Yeah. The the 
the Indians that, that take the most type of combo, the most points of combo are the hunters. Yeah. The hunters, they have something they call Panema. Panema is when they go hunt, they start tracking the deer the whole day, and when they're getting really near, accidentally they step on a stick, and this gets the animal to run away. They go and shoot, but misses. Yeah. They, they, so when they're not able to bring food home, they, they uh, know they have the Panema. There is kind of a, a bad luck. Yeah. So during this, they set up their intentions to doing the process of the cleansing. They say that this can be stay in you. So once you you purge that, you're opening your ways. And then this is something they always do. First thing after the combo, yeah, without looking at nobody, without saying nothing to nobody, they go to hunt. Yeah, and most of the time bring some big deers home. Uh, another medicine is called Sananga. Yeah. Sananga is a general term for eye drops. Yeah. There is seven types of Sanangas yeah, with different uses. Uh, most of them are based on vision accuracy for hunting. They are also used in ceremonies to open vision and are also used to treat bad headaches and convulsions there in the tribe. So there's, there's a, in, in this great uh, extensive quantity of medicines, there is a small group that they call the sacramental medicines. Is the medicines they, use, they are used by the pages. Yeah. Those medicines, they believe they were the first one to be discovered. Yeah. So talking about first the Umi, yeah, also that I mentioned before, also known as ayahuasca. The Umi uh, for them is their main medicine, yeah, and is made by is a tea yeah, made by a vine which they call Umi, uh, that needs to be smashed and a leaf they call Kawa. Together with this, they mix that, put water, and this tea is made. Yeah. So this tea yeah, and its effects uh, when it expands your consciousness yeah, and, and gives you extrasensorial perception yeah, uh, is their main connection with the spiritual realm. Yeah. Is their main connection with the spirits of the forest. And it's important to most, most studies that were done about this medicine would classify as hallucinogenic. Yeah. So after, and it's, it's important for us to put this something that uh, it doesn't generate any kind of audio visual hallucinations. Yeah. It puts you into a visionary state, what they call entheogenical, where you have experience with the sacred. So as I was sharing, you close your eyes and you start having this huge experience, but as soon as you decided to open your eyes, uh, these, all these visions, they stop. Yeah. For, for the whole period of the ceremony, you know who you are, you know where you are, you know what time you are. So there's, there's this distinguish between hallucinogenic and entheogenic. Yeah. Together with Uni, there's the rapé. Yeah. It's a snuff made with tobacco in the bark of a tree called sunu. Yeah. This snuff doesn't get you any visions, yeah. but it puts you into a higher state of connection, of concentration, of mental accuracy, yeah. and is used mostly in their spiritual works, and their healing spiritual works, and also for cleanses as well. Yeah. Well, the, the snuff is blown by this uh, these tubes called TP, or uh, there's the individual also called Kuripi, yeah, and is made just with the bones of their sacred animals. Yeah. Last but not least is the Supa. Supa is a medicine that is a resin of a of a tree. Yeah. This resin you take and you put it into the coals, and it generates a white smoke. It was the first smoke I ever knew that uh, doesn't hurt your eyes or lungs. Yeah. And in these smokes, they do a special prayer on it during the ceremonies. So in those ceremonies, 
I will start paying more attention and I notice that what the young people sing is completely different of what the pajé sing. Yeah? The pajé also sings what they're singing, but uh, the length, the, the, the melody, many aspects, you see there's something different on it. Yeah? I got really impressed yeah, knowing the pajés, yeah, Tata and Yawa. They are the two only one left in the whole tribe. Tata and Yawa are, are also the two oldest people in their tribe. Yeah? Tata has, is coming almost to 100 years old, and Yawa is, is past that. Yeah? So I will start paying attention. How, how Indians that can be so old, Tata now is already blind from the two eyes. Yeah? Those people, they're so old, how can they have so much energy? We look to, you look to them and you see them kind of sad or, you know, their, their uh, physical aspects. But once you go talk to them, you see there's a boy inside that body. You, once you go to do ceremonies with them, they spend the whole night singing, where there's young people at their side sleeping and snoring. Yeah? So this got me really, how, how they are able to do this, how they are able to preserve their culture reflected on their songs, in their prayers, on their legends and stories. Yeah? And it was then that I first, that I had my first contact with the indigenous concept of diet, the dietas. Yeah? So the diet, the dietas, they can be divided. No, so the dietas, they are, they are used to reach a state of spiritual learning and personal power development. Yeah. This diet, you need to renounce certain things. Yeah. You renounce sweet, so of course sugar, yeah. but uh, for them sweet is fruits, yeah. any kind of sweet. You renounce meat, and you renounce water and sex. Those, those dietas, they can be separated in two main groups. Yeah. There's the Ranu and Suya. This first group is when the Pajé prays to you. Yeah? And how he prays to you, he gets a little pot, yeah? fill up with uh, this manioc juice, and start singing in a special way, in a different, not language, but a more, a deeper uh, into, their, into their language. And sing the whole night, sing the whole night in this pot. Yeah. After that, if you, the, in, in this first group, this type of healing, uh, they, can, they have two, two main goals. Yeah. To cure, to heal somebody that is ill, yeah, or to transfer some spiritual knowledge. So in this first group, the jihadists, they are more, their, their length is between one to three months. Yeah. And the second group of jihadists is one you stop being the patient, right? Because when you're the patient, this one to three month diet is for you to preserve energetically what he put in inside you. And the second group is more about uh, being the doctor. Yeah? It's more about knowing how to do that, yeah? knowing how, how to enter in connection with the spirits of the forest and, and in the case of healing with the spirit of the sickness, uh, and how to work with that. Yeah? They believe that every single sickness is related to a spirit. Yeah? So in, in that way, they diagnose your, 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 your sickness by your dream. Yeah? That's the main diagnosis for them. Yeah? Tata shared with me, they say, you guys do uh, blood tests and all this. For us, it's all about their dreams. Yeah? So, uh, so uh, and those those this second group of dietas, yeah, they are done by the pajés, the elders, Tata and Yawa would say that to me, with when they're already really really old. Yeah. Yawa did his dieta with 65 years old, Tata with 50 years old. So once I start uh, getting to know them, of course I had a lot of interest in, and I was planning on someday entering a, a dieta like this. But uh, 
uh, at the moment I was 18 years old and I was already studying engineer. So my first plan was to graduate and then enter to a, a study like that. But concerning to their health and their age, I start seeing how risky it will be for me to to stick with my university yeah, that uh, he has been going for 15 years and I, I, I'm pretty sure you go for more 50 yeah, then and risk losing this precious opportunity. Yeah. With the, the trips that I have been doing for that, I've started getting to have a feeling of family with them. So they're opening up a whole opportunity that was unique for me. And uh, so I decided to pause my university and everything I was doing on my work to enter in a, in a study like this. Yeah. So I will start preparing, uh, I will start doing kind of a strategy. So I talked with the people of, of the university, which was pretty easy compared to the task of convincing my father and my mother to allow me to spend four months by myself in those conditions at the forest. But once I did that, yeah, once we, we talked, Tata came to our home, we had ceremonies, we had an agreement was formed where Tata assured me that he would take care of me. Yeah. And uh, so the muka, yeah, the diet that I, I went to do is the muka diet yeah, that belongs to the second group. Yeah. It is a full year yeah, and it takes a retreat from four months. During this retreat, you have no contact with many people, with children, with noises, without that. And the muka is a root, something like a, a potato, but really long. Yeah. There is also in the second group, you no, know, what? The runua, shina, that is for, uh, is used for spiritual knowledge. So once I decided to do that and everything was clear, I came, I went to Mutum village, which is Tata, uh, where Tata lives. Once I arrived there, yeah, this village, it works like this. It has the main village where everybody lives. And deeper into the forest, it has what they call their spiritual center. It's where their medicines are made, where the, the ceremonies happen and all this. And this is uh, divided in, in three different areas. The beginner area, that is for people that uh, wants to have the initial experience that has no experience at all with the medicines and want to get to know. There is also the intermediate that is for people that will do those small diets. And there's the double black diamond area <laughs> <laughs> that is reserved for this type of, of retreats, yeah, the second group of Gietas. Once I got there, yeah, uh, we went to, to build where I will be to build my hut. They believe that uh, for every single one that will do this type of dieta, a new place needs to be opened up. Yeah. So we, and these three areas, the beginning, intermediate, and they are measured about how deep they are in the forest. Yeah. So after walking a, a little bit, we were able to find a good space with a good stream. And it was my, my hut was built. Yeah. So in August 18th, I began my muka diet. Yeah. And the way, the way it happens is you go to that plant, the muka, uh, you are already selected, and when the sun is about to set, yeah, you go and talk to it yeah, as it was a spirit in front of you. Yeah. So you present, you introduce yourself, you present your intention, and you make a special wish. Yeah. After this, you go to your hut, yeah, it, and it was then that I spent my first night all by myself in the jungle. Honestly, I had no clue what to do. Yeah. I ate, uh, it was really but I, I didn't felt any effects. So I decided to stay on my hammock. And once I was half asleep, half awake, yeah, 
I could feel my my ears kind of decompressing. I could feel my, my mind getting to a different mindset. I could feel many aspects of myself transforming into that night. So I eventually fall asleep and in the next day I had my first visit and my first meal. Yeah. So during this diet, this dieta, you cannot drink pure water. Yeah. So for the four months I were there, I were drinking some 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 a, a drink made from out of corn. Yeah. And without any sweet, so my first meal it was this green banana cake yeah, that you can eat one uh, each day. It uh, absolutely has no taste at all, so you're just putting it inside your stomach. Uh, during the first three days, I, I didn't have any visit yeah, from Tata. And with this special type of food diet that I was eating, my body started feeling really weak, really weak. I would sit up and eventually uh, stand up fast. I would start to get dizzy. And I, I, it came to a point that I almost couldn't move. And at that point, I had no family around. I had no technology around. I had nobody to count with. Yeah. And this put, uh, started putting me into an introspection process where I had to face myself and only myself during these three days. After the third day, Tata came to visit me. He prayed for me, uh, but it wasn't a mandioc juice. It was a special ink. Yeah? Uh, and when he pr was praying on that ink, I drank a little bit and put everything on me. Yeah? And this, he was praying to open up my spiritual path. He was trans transferring already some of the knowledge he had to me. And once he did that, my energy would increase and increase and increase into a point, into a point that I could do my ascetic practice. Yeah. So this ascetic practice, it concerned about food diet, yeah, the studies, meditation, physical exercises, rituals and ceremonies, sessions with Tata, prayers, and dreams. Yeah. The food diet, how it works, it, it starts really restrict. Yeah. At the first day, you can only drink two fingers of that drink, and you can only eat this banana cake, green banana cake. Uh, and with time, after the first, after the the first month, you can start to eat fish. Yeah. It was a tiny little fish that was 90% bones. But for me, it looked like a huge salmon just by myself. Uh, and, with, and then with the months going by, it started uh, getting less restrict until a point that the full year is completed and you can get back to meat, sweet, sex, and water. So in the studies, man, it worked like that. Uh, I had my place there where I couldn't go. Uh, out, I could even had the I hadn't the energy to do trails at the first month, so I needed to be really uh, standing my ground right there. And Tata would visit me. Tata would visit me, and we went there in ceremonies. Where in those ceremonies, he would start explaining to me deeper into their stories, deeper into their prayers, into their chants and their practice. So after this, I would go to my office. That yeah, was a clear that I opened up in the forest so I could study that. Yeah. And Tata, he can communicate in Portuguese, he, but uh, for him to explain su such a thing as a healing uh, that is so complex, it's even hard to speak in their native language, it was too hard for him. Yeah. So I had also the company of Matsini. Matsini is his official apprentice. Yeah, he is Obi Wan Kenobi. Uh, he he has he speaks fluent uh, the Portuguese, so he was able to make it pretty pretty simple and uh, for me to understand and and use it. Yeah. So <clears throat> during those sessions, Tata introduced me to a new kind of prayer. Prayer. Uh, 
they don't pray asking, they pray thinking. Yeah, for instance, if somebody is ill, they don't pray asking for this person to get healed. They thank, they thank for the person that is already healed. So this is affirmative prayer. Yeah? During this prayer is when they use the sipa, the white smoke, yeah? and they talk really firm, yeah? but, but thinking. Yeah? And this got me really interested on it. Yeah? I did a whole translation and, and did that for a while. So the, the, the last of the practice yeah, that for me was the, I think the, the most different yeah, is the dreams. Yeah. I have never had before the Jeta any type of special dreams or vivid, lucid, vivid dreams, all that. Yeah. After the intake of the diet of, of the Mukha and the prayer he did to me, it opened up a whole new uh, level talking about dreams. And, uh, for them, they have a special value. The dream has a special value to them. Their dream is, is a portal, is a entrance to the spiritual realm where they can receive revelations, they can meet spirits, and even predict some diseases that could come. Yeah. Uh, during the dreams is where Tata would see to me to see how was my performance at the diet. Yeah. There are some details that for us doesn't have any importance, but for them is in the details that everything it is. Yeah. So I'll share a little bit about my my day. Yeah. What, what I would do. So the day began really different yeah, that uh, it used to begin in my my life. Yeah. My day used to begin 40 minutes before my first university class. And uh, that I would just eat uh, something and go running and be there. Yeah. The day there starts while it's still dark. Yeah. So we wake up around 4 a.m., uh, go next to a fire. There you're supposed to keep this fire going for the whole process you're there. And there you take some rapé and you start remembering, you start bringing what you have dreamed to this reality. Yeah. I, I share with Tata, I was like, I had a dream of the, those people were chanting something, and like, what they are chanting? Who are those people? How how they are dressed? So uh, this this first time of the day is for you to fully try to remember and, and and put the pieces together of your dream. After this, when the sun starts to rise, is the hours of powers, sunset and sunrise, and these hours are reserved for the ruawaki, the affirmative prayers. Now. So, uh, in those on those prayers, you you burn yeah, the supa, and you speak in this affirmative tone, yeah, thanking for everything you, you would wish, yeah, thanking for the the uh, main wish you've done once you start your diet. After this, I will go to the stream, have a good bath, and uh, we'll go to my office study, yeah, unless Tata would visit me and we'll go on to the ceremonies for the rest of the of the evening. Yeah. So I'm still on the process yeah, of the I'm still on the dieta, the muka. Of course I'm now with seven months yeah, from my diet and my food diet is being rest restricted in a way that I can travel, I can I can how to say Interact. Yeah. So I will start once I I will start studying what was the main result for me yeah, of the this period yeah, recluding the forest. Yeah. So during this this time I could really encounter with my higher self. Yeah. And this higher my higher self showed me the essence of life. Yeah. Through renouncing some of those things, even body needs. Yeah. I was able to comprehend and understand yeah, how how many things are possible. Yeah. I will, uh, I started to envision yeah, synchronicity. Yeah. Uh, as I was praying and asking for something, uh, a, a bird came here and and, and flew and, and was stopped right and looking at me, or our star, a uh, falling star. I would see. So all this would start making some 
some some sense to me somehow. Yeah? And the ultimate goal, yeah, was for me was to see kind of the 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 extension and and how big it is the love of God, the love that we feel inside of us. Yeah, I could see the love of God in in in, in Tata's wise word, in the children, in, in the chanting of the bird, in 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 the patterns of the animals of the snakes. Yeah. And this start this this feeling of love evolved to a feeling of gratitude. Yeah, I could, I, I really changed. Yeah, uh, with with that, yeah, all all my 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 identity, I was able to fully comprehend more. Yeah, and with, together with this trust on this on my identity, I can do this. I can stay four months in in in. in Alone in the jungle, I can stay one year uh, uh, holding this this type of diet. I, so this started opening up new horizons for me. Yeah, and this this feeling of gratitude yeah, was how can I repay something like this? Yeah, how how, how I felt like giving something back? Yeah, how how can I help? Yeah, the maximum that I try will never. Be even compared with the what I've received, yeah. So, uh, but at the same time, I needed to do something, yeah. I needed to help them in in, in a way. So, as Hart mentioned, I'm a board member of Indigenous Celebration NGO, yeah. And we cre we create we develop projects to preserve and sustain. Their their traditions, the the knowledge and wisdom of the pages, and also the protection and conservation of the reserve, that is around 600,000 acres. Yeah. And so taking taking a look at Amazon, yeah, I could I could really see uh, this forest yeah, as a huge library. Yeah, that each single plant and animal has a story to tell and a use for it. Yeah, but this this forest, this library was on fire. Yeah, there was only four people taking care of the of the library, and this starts to shook me. Yeah, the the experience that I have. Yeah, would my son or would the generations after me will still have the same opportunity? Yeah, so for me. The solution, yeah. So once, once I started seeing this, yeah, and seeing how big yeah, the problem is in Amazonia, how 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 is this problem that uh, that uh, is burning such a library, yeah. So the main ecological function of Amazon is the biotic pump, yeah. It takes from the Atlantic Ocean per day 20 billion of ton of vapor of water, yeah. Transforming this into uh, aerial flying rivers yeah, that travels thousands and thousands of miles, delivering uh, rain and humidity. Due the 20% of deforestation plus 20% of degraded areas, this biotic pump is not working so much. Yeah, this these flying rivers are starting to shrink. Yeah, as we can see, this taking planetary consequences. Yeah, as we can see here, the droughts in California, the excessive rain in the Amazon, and the the lack of, of rain in c cities at Sao Paulo. Yeah. So for that, yeah, how 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 is that our way out? Yeah. Uh, and for me, yeah, what, what I what I conclude is supporting and fortifying the community of indigenous people. Yeah. They were there for the last 10,000 years, yeah? and, and they were able to uh, interact with it without destroying in a totally sustainable way. And <clears throat> so they are the, the great environmental masters. Yeah? But unfortunately, to the contact with white people, they were starting to lose their identity and old habits. Yeah? So, to, so we started with together with indigenous celebration, developing yeah, some projects that will help preserve their culture. 
Yeah. First one was the empowerment of the women's association. Yeah. We created a online store. Yeah. What people from each part of the planet could buy those products. So bracelets, uh, art craft, all this. Yeah. Uh, there was also where we are working right now is the sustainable use of forest wo uh, wood residues yeah, in order to do uh, rustic furniture. So what is that? Uh, the 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 trees of Amazon, yeah, the huge trees. Yeah. The the their their roots are not so so vertical as the the the, the nutrients are in the ground. They're more horizontally. So with with a regular wind, uh, many of those huge trees fall down naturally, and it's based on that that we would uh, use these resources that had completely no interaction of man, and used to something as doing the furniture. Uh, during my process there in the Gieta, yeah, uh, a traditional school was formed. Yeah, based on this generation gap, yeah, the leader, the chief yeah, of Mutum, that is the only woman chief of the whole tribe, she decided to create this, where the children, they stay there for a whole month, and they're completely uh, prohibited to speak Portuguese. So they're, uh, in their language, they're starting to have lessons and classes about their traditions, their education, and how to behave. Yeah. And it's, it was really nice to see that many of the troublemakers, the little kids that would spend the day just doing bad stuff, they went into this traditional school. They were the most creative and active students there. So it's already a great result that is coming. Yeah. The, this is not helping just the kids. Yeah. The elders used to feel really isolated. Yeah. They had so much knowledge about themselves, about what it is to be a Yawanawa, and they saw completely no interaction yeah, with their kids or their grandsons. So this is a project that is benefiting the whole tribe. Together with this, we have uh, the video game and about Yawanawa culture in a VR experience, a virtual reality experience of sightseeing of their daily life. And at that time, I would like to invite uh, our uh, indigenous celebration present to speak a, a little bit about this project. Thank you, Jordao. Um, so first, I would just like to mention that our mission at Indigenous Celebration is to facilitate the transfer of wisdom between Indigenous peoples and the modern world. And we're doing this through a celebration of culture. Um, with that strategy, we're able to empower Indigenous peoples in two very important ways. The first is economic. Uh, by having these sustainable revenue streams, we're able to economically empower the people, which is absolutely critical to a community's ability to protect their lands from deforestation threats. The second way is a cultural empowerment. Um, by creating these revenue streams through a celebration of culture, we're able to impart a sense of the value of what it is that they truly hold there, the value of their wisdom, their, their knowledge, and their culture. So we're very excited to explore the use of different technologies to develop these remote, culturally immersive experiences through virtual reality, augmented reality, and gaming experiences, since this will exponentially increase our ability to reach people far beyond how many people we could physically bring uh, into the village. So what we're currently working on developing is a gaming experience that tells the ancestral legends traditionally passed down orally from generation to generation. We're discovering that through gaming, we can effectively preserve the language, which is currently at threat of disappearance due to this generational gap that Jordao has already mentioned. And we're able to transmit these ancestral teachings that were always only passed down orally. So by gamifying storytelling, we're able to create interactive experiences that will engage people cross-culturally, 
will create bridges, and most importantly, it will create an awareness around what is at stake here. What is at stake of being lost if we don't consciously begin to fortify the indigenous peoples, their culture, their wisdom, uh, and their specific knowledge in harmony with nature? Study after study finds that the most effective and most economic way of preserving the forest is to simply empower the people that have been living there for 10,000 years. Uh, over that period of time, they've really developed a specific knowledge about their own home, and it makes them far more qualified than any other environmental group that might be stationed there to do that same conservation work. And finally, I would just like to mention that perhaps the most underrated strategy to combat climate change is to end deforestation. So protecting the remaining forests by empowering the indigenous peoples will save more carbon from our atmosphere than all of our efforts to implement green you know, energy technology and cap industrial emissions combined. So with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Jordao. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to end my talk with an uh, invitation. Yeah. You that are watching me right now, yeah, I invite you to close your computer, stand up, and come to help us. Come to experience, come to, to visit our tribe, come to meet Tata, to experience the medicine world, and see by yourself why I'm talking. Yeah. We need help to take in these projects, to develop those projects. So you have connections, you have certain skills. We need you. Yeah? You're mostly welcome to join us. Thank you very much. Yeah. You need a microphone. It's because this is recorded. If anybody may have, even though we are well over time, this working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if anybody has a question, it's most welcome um, for us to ask. Um, but I would ask you please use the microphone so that people in the remote side can hear your questions as well. And also can see the recording. Anybody interested in? Uh, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, could you talk about the concerts? Yes. The uh, concerts project? So, uh, I feel that my job here now is to do the bridge between those indigenous people and uh, the white people. Yeah. So what we are doing together with indigenous celebration is to create a concert yeah, to share their sacred music. Yeah. And is this concert will happen here in U.S., in Miami, and possibly California, and also New York. Yeah. So this concert is made by the, the, the kids, the young generation, they are studying yeah, into the traditional school. Yeah. So this, uh, for our main goal, is not only to share this experience, but also put them to, to see from their own eyes yeah, how valuable is their culture. So I, I used to be a chemist, and in chemistry there's a field called natural products chemistry, mm -hmm. which is basically the science of looking at you know, plants and uh, animals, things like this, and sort of trying to uh, you know, extract uh, compounds from them that have medicinal purposes. And I know a lot of people do this, but I, I feel that a lot of their, their approaches is somewhat blind and that they sort of you know just go and collect plants from the forest mm -hmm. without any sort of particular direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and it certainly sounds like from your talk that there's a lot of wisdom in the indigenous communities in the Amazon about specifically which plants can be used for uh, which purposes. So I'm wondering if there are any efforts maybe through the Brazilian government or through any nonprofits which um, you know try to actually sort of characterize some of these medicines scientifically and uh, sort of you know connect natural products chemists uh, with these uh, you know uh, uh -huh. uh, shamans that know how to use them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, about the government, there's not much that is being done. Yeah. But uh, there's also some foundations. Yeah. For instance, 
the the with the combo the frog yeah, they're doing a whole research on how to use it and all this and the plants the problem is that uh, the people who has this type of knowledge here yeah, they are not so well connected yeah, to 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 the indigenous community right there so I feel that is the is the main block why this haven't happened yet yeah so but for sure is is, is something that uh, we, we we will be working on uh, to to how to say uh, categorize that somehow yeah and possibly uh, expand yeah. something that we were a little bit concerned is about the whole thing of patent and 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 this so first approach to that will be to do this in their language and what they decide to share with us yeah, uh, I think we, sh we, we need to, to respect yeah, because most uh, those those Nipoy who these men of medicines they if, if you appear there he have never seen you in his life but if you are sick he will treat you yeah, he will take care of you but to teach you is a whole <laughs> a different thing yeah, there's a, a bound that needs to, to be made. Uh, in their culture, they just teach for relatives, for their son or their son-in-law. Yeah. So to, to have this kind of... But uh, I'm sure uh, that this is this uh, will advance, we will evolve somehow. Yeah. We, we have uh, already somebody that uh, he is studying this here in Western University. And he's really interested in, in doing this experience right there. So I, th I believe that for the next year, that this will start to, to, to get in, in process. Um, I just had a question about, because the focus of this uh, of this NGO is, is the Yawanawa and I'm just I was just wondering if there's any plan to liaison or sort of interact with other indigenous rights organizations like around around the Americas and around the world uh-huh yeah because I see our NGO is a uh, is still a, a baby yeah it's it, it, it is born but it's still a baby so uh, we are starting small. Yeah? Uh, we, 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 by the, the connection that I have with this tribe, we decided to, to focus on this tribe. But of course, as we get bigger and we start growing, yeah, we would like to interchange yeah? because it's an indigenous celebration. So everything that is indigenous is our field of work. Yeah? We have uh, already had contact with some persons of other foundations that would like to, you know, share experience and work together. But this is still also in uh, in process. Yeah. It's been widely known that the big pharmaceutical industries have been patenting or trying to patent plants in the Amazonian rainforest, um, which shouldn't be patentable. What is the position, or what can be done uh, about the knowledge of the, uh, uh, I pronounce the Yawanawa uh, tribe and others that have this uh, old gnosis or knowledge about the, the healing plant medicines and how that can be protected? Because it seems like the synthetic medicines <coughs> of Big Pharma has been mostly damaging the consciousness of humanity and. What would be a, a process to to stop that and to wake people up in, in regard to having companies steal what is not theirs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I see the what what I believe that could be done is the connection yeah, of people being aware that this works as well. Yeah. Because living here, they, they, they know that the Indians treat, uh, treat themselves with, with the plants and all this, but uh, it's really superficial. Yeah? There, there's no much deep into it. So what I believe 
is for us to, as was something similar that he was pointing out, né, for us to study né, this process of instead of us getting the, the physical aspect uh, or, or the, the chemical compound, or we, we could uh, do uh, the, what, what they call Nipui, né, is the garden of medicines. Né. They have a place there uh, that the elders would take, uh, would go travel and find these medicines and bring, né, and, and, and it starts to, to collect and, and categorize that somehow. Yeah. So I don't have so much knowledge about uh, the, the pharmaceutical area, but I believe what can be done yeah, to 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 heal that, that 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 situation is to let people know that this alternative uh, medicines exists. Yeah. It is not something that there is there are on the legends. Yeah. Something there is used today. Yeah. <laughs> There's something uh, to uh, uh, okay. because, see, how, how, as Jordan said, uh, forest is burning. See, thousands of species. Well, we are facing a real mass extinction nowadays, not only in Amazonia but all over the world. That's what's going on. See, so uh, tá bom. So uh, the, the most uh, important now is to preserve the knowledge that was acquired during the last 10 millenniums in Amazonia. And this knowledge is disappearing because pages are very old, they will die, the young people are not so interested. Now, Jordan and his group went there and motivated the new people, how say, to start to study. Now, Hartmut went there too and started, uh, how say, with the Google Gifted program, we could uh, support the formation of new seven pages, young people. So most important now, Peter, is to preserve the knowledge, assuring that it will be transmitted to the new generations through oral tradition. That, that, that's the key point. Okay, maybe last question. <coughs> Thank you. Shadow, some uh, doctors take people to the Amazon to help them with different conditions and um, also specifically addictions. And I wonder what type of retreats are available and if this is also something that's uh, in sight with the Yawanawa uh, mm -hmm. project you mm -hmm. promote. Yeah. Uh, this uh, is, is happening, but uh, in a is in a, in a small scale, yeah? because of the I would say not so many people has this contact. Even though the Indians have this this power to 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 treat something like that, those those hard type of addictions. Yeah? But uh, there's already have been many results about that. Yeah? Together is uh, implementing the medicine into this treatment. Now, I know I would say five or to seven people that have quit smoking with the rapé, yeah. and it's something that uh, it, it wasn't kind of a, a, a swap of addictions. Yeah. He he used the rapé to, that contains the nicotine of the tobacco, uh, in, 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 and then uh, gradually was reducing the use of rapé until a moment that he stopped completely. Yeah. So I believe that uh, the medicine has a key factor of that because mainly uni. Yeah? Once you you drink uni and 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 you start the, those visions, they're not just like movies or, or something that is really entertainment. Yeah? Sometimes they go deep into yourself. Yeah? They start showing things that you don't want to see. Yeah? So that's the difference. Many people, for instance, drink alcohol to forget many things, to bury many things. But at the point they start drinking uni, all this flourish, all this comes up, they're wanting or not. So it's a, it's a, it's a different method, yeah? but uh, for what I have seen, uh, it's pretty effective. Mm -hmm. 
going on? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Next, uh, next July. Next July, we will have a, a, a big trip to their festival. And we one project here that we didn't mention, that, but it's the ethno-tourism that we, we, we want to, to... Because the tribe is just hoping for other people to come in their festival. Yeah. So what we're developing through the ethno-tourism to open, let's say, five people per month, or even two, just to begin with, something that feel really comfortable. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it, there's this part of it, there's, a, there's the whole anti-marketing of it, you know? You, you, you cannot go there expecting that, uh, I say, you will be served, that you're going to a hotel or something like this. Uh, is the is the is the is is the way of living in community in the cooperative system. Yeah. So our next trip will be in July. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then yeah, thank you so much, mm -hmm. Jordan, for this uh, very fascinating talk, and thank you, Paula, for bringing him along and <laughs> supporting. And thank you for all being so attentive listeners going way past uh, the time, including, I see all the guys on the video conference seem to still be there. So apologies for being a bit over time, but I think it was well worth it. Mm -hmm. Thank you one more time for the mm -hmm. very nice Thank, thank you, so you too. Hard.